The uh, Subcommittee on Livestock and Foreign Agriculture's uh, hearing will now come to order. Uh, the uh, topic of this morning's uh, hearing is safeguarding American agriculture from wild invasive and non-native species, a challenge that, uh, that uh, has plagued uh, American agriculture throughout the various regions of our country uh, historically and one that uh, American agriculture has to contend with, and we hope to have a, 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 um, uh, a balanced uh, group of witnesses to testify here today as to those challenges. And while the subcommittee obviously's jurisdiction is, is on livestock and foreign agriculture, a lot of our focus as it relates to these issues of um, wild invasive and non-native species uh, relate to the foreign um, agricultural part of the um, of the jurisdiction of this subcommittee because as we know uh, so much of American agriculture is exported and oftentimes we have to contend with issues uh, on uh, our ability to market our products uh, abroad uh, with regards to issues of uh, uh, invasive uh, species um, that um, are non-native species that uh, uh, other uh, parts of the world uh, argue uh, that may not meet phytosanitary standards, and it's a part of our challenge and a part of our effort. So uh, I welcome the uh, attendance here today of the members of the subcommittee, and we look to hold a, uh, a good hearing uh, with the witnesses that we have uh, before us. Uh, I want to thank everybody for, for being here. Obviously, uh, the impacts of uh, invasive and non-native species um, uh, impact agricultural supply chains. Um, we have a group of witnesses here that uh, deal with these issues regularly um, and um, how we, uh, in fact, deal with steps on importers and exporters uh, that we uh, attempt to try to keep uh, invasive species um, uh, from impacting the uh, various commodities that we produce so that trade can continue. The subcommittee oversees, uh, obviously, uh, key parts of the U.S. Department's functions that partner with addresses that involve wildlife services at the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, as well as the Department of Ag Trade Promotion efforts. Recently, I had an uh, intervention uh, with USDA and working on a problem that we had with China on tomato seeds, for example. Um, our discussion, I think, is going to complement the good work of our colleagues on the Biotechnology, Horticulture, and Research Subcommittee, uh, of which we have some members here uh, this morning who serve on that committee as well, uh, as well as the Conservation and Forest Subcommittee. And so uh, the hope is, to, uh, while there's overlap, to complement our, our efforts with the other two subcommittees. Uh, specifically from my own background, I can tell you in California, uh, uh, we have a host of these issues, both in invasive and, uh, and non-native species. Um, examples of those is the nutria populations that have damaged wetlands and farmlands, but they've also taken place in Maryland and they've taken place in Louisiana as well. Uh, we also have uh, wild birds that have played uh, a role in introducing Newcastle virus in poultry flocks, um, and while in other states, uh, these animals have also been linked to similar uh, damage and disease that has taken place. Um, so uh, it's, it's an issue that affects the entire country, region to region. On the 2018 Farm Bill uh, that we all worked on together, we started a pilot project to address the issue of uh, feral swine in the southeast. Uh, I look forward to hearing more about how the initial implementation of this program is going. If the pilot project's working well, I, I would suggest to members here, the subcommittee and the full committee, that we might be a model uh, to address invasive species issues in the future. Um, and so we, I think, need to look at that. Along our southern border and our ocean ports, the seasonal nature, nature of the specialty crop industry means trucks and barges carrying fruits and vegetables from outside the U.S. are potential vectors for dangerous pests that have not yet been established in this country. And uh, I've been at the, the border both through California all the way to Texas and uh, I've seen the concern and the attempt to address 
uh, that from uh, ensuring that it doesn't happen. For all these reasons and more, I think many of our colleagues today here are joined uh, with the ag agriculture inspector resources at our ports and other points of entry. We can't expect customs and border protection or the Department of Agriculture to evolve its capabilities to match these involving threats, uh, in my view, without the resources to do so. And I think that's one of the things we want to hear about here today is whether or not we're actually providing the necessary resources to do that. So um, with that said, um, I um, want to uh, uh, make sure that all members uh, understand that in consultation with the ranking member, pursuant to Rule 1, uh, 11E, uh, to make sure that members of the subcommittee are aware and other members of the full committee may join with us today. Uh, obviously, we welcome in that participation. So I want to welcome our witnesses um, and recognize uh, my esteemed ranking uh, member, uh, Mr. Rouser from North Carolina, for any remarks. Well, right, right. Sure. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, former chairman, ranking member Conway here. Would you like to uh, open? Well, sure. Thank you. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. <coughs> I want to thank uh, Chairman Costa and uh, ranking member Rouser for having me here today. I'd like to touch on one of the most <coughs> more devastating examples of invasive species that is currently affecting Texas in addition to the southeast. Um, much of uh, our country uh, is called uh, feral swine. Uh, farmers, ranchers, and landowners have been dealing with the destructive destruction caused by wild pigs for decades. Most estimate that feral swine cause over $1.5 billion in damages each year, with at least $800 million of that amount attributed directly to agriculture. But the problem is growing so much that it's not just affecting those in rural areas. In, in 2017, the Dallas City Council authorized a three-year service contract for control and abatement of feral hogs on city property. Feral swine are capable of breeding at just six months and have a gestation period of 115 days. Their reproduction, they reproduce at such a high rate that you would have to remove uh, more than two-thirds of the feral swine population every year just to keep the population stable. These hogs can be vectors for several diseases, including foot and mouth and African swine fever. Sw uh, feral swine have also had an unbelievable impact on native species and ecosystems. According to USDA, feral swine, ha feral swine have played a role in the decline of nearly 300 native plants and animals in the U.S. alone. I'm proud that in the 2018 Farm Bill, we established the Feral Swine Eradication and Control Pilot Program, directing APHIS and NRCS to coordinate the removal of feral swine, restore habitat, and provide assistance to producers for uh, feral swine control. We funded the program at $75 million in, and in June, USDA announced funding availability for projects in nine states, including Texas. I'm glad we're holding this hearing to review the impact of native species writ large on American agriculture. I want to thank uh, all the witnesses for being here today and sharing your perspectives. I look forward to your testimony. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Conway. Uh, I'll now uh, defer to uh, the ranking member of the subcommittee, uh, Representative Browser from North Carolina. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I look forward to today's hearing uh, to consider uh, how we are currently safeguarding American agriculture from wild, invasive, and non-native species, and to discuss what steps we can take to improve uh, these efforts. Invasive species pose a significant threat to the success of production agriculture and environmental stewardship. And it's important that we continue to improve the coordinated national strategy to both prevent the introduction of invasive species and to eradicate the ones that we already have. In the 2018 Farm Bill, we made significant strides in safeguarding American agriculture from inv invasive pest. Mirrored after the successful plant pest and disease prevention program, we created the National Animal Disease Preparedness and Response Program providing funding for USDA to enter into partnerships with states, universities, and others to fund targeted prevention, preparedness, detection, and response activities. The Farm Bill also provided funding, as has been mentioned already, for a feral swine eradication program, which as of today has made funding available for projects in nine states. While our trading relationships continue to benefit American farmers and ranchers, increasing levels of imports come with additional pest and disease threats. And as I've said at nearly every hearing, in fact, almost everyone probably on this committee uh, has said it at one time or another, it is so critically imperative that we 
ratify USMCA. In addition to increased market access and the numerous protections and economic benefits that will stem from ratification of this agreement across the agriculture industry, USMCA will foster further opportunities between the three countries to monitor, prevent, detect, and eradicate invasive species. I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. Each of you play an important role in safeguarding American agriculture, and we thank you for it. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, the chair would request uh, that other members submit their opening statements for the record so we may begin with our witnesses and their testimony to ensure that there's ample time for questions. Um, I would like to welcome all of our witnesses uh, and uh, introduce you uh, uh, collectively uh, before we begin. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Rick Ortega, who I've worked with over the years, General Manager and Director of Policy and Governmental Affairs for Grassland Water District in Los Banos. Uh, Congressman Cox and I share the kind of overlap of the entirety of Grasslands uh, Irrigation Water District. It's the largest uh, wetlands, contiguous wetlands, uh, in the United States, which is a fairly interesting effort, uh, and it really is a key part of the Pacific Flyway from Canada all the way to Mexico. Uh, we're glad to have you here and talk about your efforts to fight with feral nutrient, and uh, we welcome you to the Ag Committee. Uh, we have a second witness here that uh, I'm going to defer to Representative Craig, who would like to introduce the second witness. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. It's an honor to introduce Dr. Beth Thompson. Thank you so much for being here. As Executive Director of the Minnesota Board of Animal Health, Dr. Thompson also serves as the Minnesota State Veterinarian. In this role, she oversees the planning and implementation of statewide programs for the detection, control, and eradication of animal diseases. Her work also includes working closely with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, the University of Minnesota, uh, undefeated Golden Gophers 9-0, and, <laughs> and the United States Department of Agriculture. Dr. Thompson, we're glad to have you here today, and I look forward to your testimony. Thank you very much, Representative Greg. Uh, the, the Minnesota's got a great team. Uh, Fresno State almost beat them in the first game of the season, but uh, we fell a little bit short. Uh, our third witness is uh, Mr. Breck Erickson, uh, Senior Vice President for Business and Affairs of J&D Produce uh, in Edinburgh, Texas. He tells me they're busy harvesting right now a host of important uh, uh, specialty crops, and uh, Mr. Erickson's involved in uh, those specialty crop production efforts in the Rio Grande Valley. Prior to his current role, he served as President and CEO of Texas International Produce Association. Brett, we thank you for being here. In addition to that, we have Mr. Kurt Reichert, uh, Fumigation Director from the Western Fumigation and Leicester, Pennsylvania. Mr. Reichert uh, works with both importers and exporters at the ports of Delaware and elsewhere to manage the transmission risks. Uh, which is part of what we want to understand better here with your testimony today. He also serves as the Western Compliance Officer, Mr. Reichert. We also look forward to hearing from your testimony. And our final witness is Mr. Joss uh, Gaskamp. I hope I pronounced that properly. Technical Con uh, Consultation Manager and Wildlife and Range Consultant for Noble Research Institute in Ardmore, Oklahoma. Uh, Mr. Gaskamp works closely with farmers and ranchers on tools and methods for addressing feral swine. And we thank you all for joining us today um, and your willingness to share your perspectives to the subcommittee. We'll now proceed with hearing from our witnesses. Each of you will have five minutes. Uh, I hope you understand the, uh, you, you have those lights in front of you. Uh, for the first uh, four minutes, it's green, and then at the uh, fifth minute, it turns yellow, and then at the... Uh, at the end of five, it turns red, and uh, you're on your own. So uh, uh, we know most of you are familiar with it. Mr. Ortega, why don't we begin with you today? And uh, we thank you for being here, and uh, we look forward to your testimony. Rick Ortega, Espanos, California. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Costa, Ranking Member Rouser, members of the committee. <clears throat> My name is Rick Ortega, and I'm the general manager of the Grassland Water District in California. Located in Merced County, we are a federal water contractor that conveys water to wetland habitat on state, federal, and private wildlife refuges in the Grassland Ecological Area. 
The wetlands in the ecological area make up the largest remaining block of freshwater wetlands in the West. <clears throat> Encompassing over 300 square miles, this habitat and surrounding wildlife beneficial agriculture, such as alfalfa, cotton, corn, wheat, and irrigated pasture, support hundreds of wildlife species and millions of migratory birds each year. With less than 10% of historical wetlands remaining in California, the ecological area is recognized by international treaty as one of the most important wetland ecosystems in the Americas. <clears throat> The ecological area is also the epicenter of California's nutria epidemic. Since their rediscovery in 2017, nearly 800 nutria have been taken and, more than, and many more documented at, at many, uh, more than 200 sites across the San Joaquin Valley. The vast majority of nutria to date have been taken within my district's boundaries. <clears throat> but now they've expanded to four other counties uh, in the San Joaquin Valley and threatened to spread further. Nutrius reach sexual maturity at four months of age and can have 40 offspring each year. They consume a quarter of their body weight per day, but destroy 10 times the plant biomass by foraging almost exclusively on the fleshy bases of vegetation, reversing hundreds of millions of dollars in restoration efforts and, and, and also agricultural revenue. <clears throat> the ecological area shares a water conveyance system with agricultural water districts through vulnerable earthen line canals. Nutria burrows are extensive, um, can extend hundreds of feet and cause uh, levee failure and loss of scarce water supplies. Uh, the, these water supplies are the lifeline of our precious remaining ecosystems and agricultural economy. Merced County alone is a $3.2 billion ag economy with over 100 types of crops grown over a million acres. Water and wildlife agencies in California fear nutria expansion could devastate the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta system. In Louisiana, nutria convert 2,000 acres of marshland into open water each year and have <clears throat> compromised their water infrastructure. This would not only impact the, the ecosystem, but the hub of the state's flood control and water delivery system, which also supplies water to over 25 million people. <clears throat> we must act now to prevent catastrophic outcomes in California. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife has taken lead on eradicating nutria in California. The department's emergency response has made great stride in slowing the growth of nutria populations while long-term resources are pursued for a formal dedicated eradication effort. Through a one-time state appropriation, they established a nutria eradication program that is now expanding to 45 staff, including five contracted specialists through the U.S. <clears throat> Department of Agriculture's Wildlife Services. This effort also seeks to evaluate and utilize all effective detection tools, including the use of scent detection dogs, eDNA, and telemetered Judah nutria. Eradication campaigns are inherently long-term and require adequate and reliable funding to ensure a successful outcome. A full-scale campaign in California is estimated to cost around $5 million per year for at least seven years before significant progress is made. The department estimates that total eradication campaign will take decades to complete based on successful efforts in other parts of the country and the network of suitable habitat in California. The department currently feels it has adequate operational funding, uh, but only through fall of 2022, uh, where they will experience a significant budget deficit if no other funds are identified. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony in the committee today. We look forward to working with you on solutions to this very real problem. Well, we thank you, uh, Mr. Ortega, for your uh, succinct uh, and concise testimony in under four minutes. Um, but uh, it's a serious problem, and of course, I've, I personally have visited uh, the challenges that you're dealing with there. Our next witness uh, is uh, Dr. Thompson. Uh, would you please proceed from Minnesota? Good morning, members. My name is Beth Thompson. I'm the state veterinarian in the great state of Minnesota and also the executive director of the Minnesota Board of Animal Health. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today about the importance of safeguarding American agriculture. It is an honor to be here today. Minnesota is one of the nation's leaders in poultry production. We are ranked number one in turkey production and also have strong broiler and egg production in our state. Many of our poultry farms are multi-generational and have supported the ag and state economy directly through jobs on farms, related businesses, and in our communities. I'm very proud to be part of agriculture in Minnesota and in the Midwest. 
In every aspect of agriculture, there is a component of a risk. In livestock agriculture, a risk that is faced by all farmers is the introduction of disease. I provided written testimony for you on poultry diseases which can be introduced via wild waterfowl and other birds. I'm going to focus my talk on avian influenza, as Minnesota has had recent experience with this disease. Certain species of wild waterfowl and shorebirds are considered to be natural reservoirs for avian influenza. There is little or no disease sign in these birds. So back in 2014 and 15, the virus that was found in domestic and commercial poultry here in the United States that dreaded H5N2 likely started in Asia and then spread to the North American wild birds via commingling of wild waterfowl because the migratory pathways of these birds overlap in the far northern hemisphere. The North American wild birds then brought the virus down into the continental United States and there was a spillover into our commercial flocks. In other words, the Eurasian H5N8 mixed with a North American low path avian influenza virus and we had the outbreak of 2015. 110 farms in Minnesota were affected and over 9 million birds either died or were depopulated because of this disease. It was estimated that the economic damage to Minnesota alone was $650 million and at least 2,500 jobs were affected. Epidemiological studies conducted revealed that there was initial, independent, point source introduction of the virus directly into these farms. While the farms that were uh, infected later on during the outbreak, it was more than likely truck traffic, workers' clothing, and the virus being carried in by other methods. This outbreak highlights the importance of many areas, but briefly to three. Number one, surveillance. Surveillance of both wild and commercial birds. The information from all of this surveillance must be shared. Wildlife researchers must share this information with state and federal livestock agencies and vice versa. This is true in peacetime and it's also true during an outbreak. And just as a note, I just received uh, from our USDA partners the National Wildlife Disease Update just before this hearing started. So that communication is going on, but it must, be, must continue. Secondly, response planning. This is also critical. During the summer of 2015, Minnesota had, at times, over 500 responders working per day on high-path avian influenza. And that number does not include the number of turkey farmers, other farmers, veterinarians, and community members that had come together to fight this disease. It was the work that was done in the months and years before the response that assisted our producers and regulatory responders. But again, that work must continue. Lastly and thirdly, biosecurity. This is a day-to-day -day process for our poultry farmers. Post high path avian influenza in 2015, researchers looked at the different types of introduction of diseases into our flocks. It is very apparent that we need to keep the disease out of the barns. All poultry sectors have recognized this need for increased biosecurity, and the National Poultry Improvement Plan has adopted minimum standards for our farmers to follow. So in closing, the U.S. poultry industry in cooperation with state and federal agencies has, has been very proactive post-2015 with efforts to fight foreign animal diseases. And a nod to our, our comrades in um, California right now that are working very hard on virulent Newcastle disease in, in that state. We can't stop the movement of wild waterfowl. However, if ag and wildlife agencies continue to work together, we will have communication, collaboration, and this will benefit our international trade. During a response, states know their farmers, their veterinarians, their communities, but we can be overwhelmed, and therefore it's also an ask that it is imperative that we have our federal partners well prepared. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, we appreciate your testimony, and uh We'll now go to Mr. Erickson. Uh, please begin with your testimony from Texas. Hello and good morning, Chairman Costa, Ranking Member Rouser, and committee members. My name is Brett Erickson, and I am Senior Vice President at JND Produce. I have worked in agriculture my entire career. Prior to joining JND, I was President and CEO of the Texas International Produce Association for six years. I am quite familiar with the challenges you are exploring here today, specifically as it relates to the fresh produce industry. We are a family-owned business based in Edinburgh, Texas in the Rio Grande Valley. We are a grower, packer, shipper, and we produce almost 40 different types of greens such as kale, chards, collards, beets, and herbs, just to name a few, as well as sweet onions, cabbage, and melons. 
We farm approximately 6,000 acres in the Rio Grande Valley with growing and packing operations also in Deming, New Mexico, Vidalia, Georgia, Vineland, New Jersey, Peru, and Mexico. We are a year-round operation and we employ approximately 180 full-time employees in the U.S. That number swells to over 500 seasonal employees in full production as we are now, and up to 750 when you include the harvest crews that are managed by farm labor contractors. Our business is quite complex, and we have several serious challenges that prevent us from growing the business as quickly as we would like to, labor being number one. I would be remiss if I did not mention how badly we need labor reforms, and I must take this opportunity to ask you all to support the Farm Workforce Modernization Act. We desperately need these changes as our business and many others like us are suffering from a severe labor crisis that threatens our ability to maintain, let alone grow, a sustainable farming business in the United States. Our customers include wholesalers and food service companies, but our primary business is dealing with retailers who sell direct to you, the U.S. consumer. Some of our customers include HEB, Wegmans, Publix, Meyer, Kroger, Albertsons, and Walmart. We utilize imports to complement our overall business to supply our customers with product year-round and, and when we are not in production in our domestic locations. We are truly an international farming and packing operation, and because of that, the flow of our product and consequently the quality and freshness of our perishable commodities are in the hands of the federal agencies who are responsible for inspecting product as it crosses the border. Additionally, the security of our domestic farms, particularly in Texas on the border, are at risk of being attacked by invasive pests and diseases. In Texas, we have seen double-digit increases year over year for the last decade for volumes of fresh fruits and vegetables. In the last 12 years, we have increased the volumes coming from Mexico 143%. The increase in imports creates a positive economic impact for our country and means that consumers can purchase whatever item they want every day of the year. The downside is that the ports are overloaded with product. Volumes have exploded and new products coming from Mexico and other parts of the world bring with them new pests and diseases. While this exponential growth in import volumes has occurred, federal agency staffing levels have not, creating bottlenecks and delays that range from a few hours to several days, at times rendering entire loads of product useless because the quality has deteriorated to the point that we can no longer send it to our customers. Today I am here to ask the committee to secure additional resources that will put more manpower at our ports of entry. Specifically, we need more USDA APHIS insect identifiers and CBP ag specialists. Furthermore, I request that more time and attention from USDA APHIS be directed towards training CBP ag specialists on insect identifications and that USDA grant more authority to well-trained CBP ag specialists uh, to make identifications and make a determination if an insect is good or bad. The challenges I detailed above are just some of the reasons I and the produce industry strongly support the Protecting America's Food and Agriculture Act of 2019. This legislation, sponsored by Representative Philemon Vela, has the support of Chairman Costa, Chairman Peterson, Senate Chairman Roberts, and Ranking Member Stabenow, and it recognizes the challenge the fresh produce industry faces. As a domestic-based grower-shipper, I am here to ask for your help to be a part of a solution to help keep American fruit and vegetable growers in business and to ensure that American agricultural interests are protected from the threat of invasive pests and diseases. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Erickson, and thank you for making reference to the uh, legislation that we're trying to move forward with. Uh, I think it is important for the uh, uh, produce uh, industry in, in, the, in the country and uh, also a shout out to the uh, um, Bipartisan uh, Agricultural Labor Reform Act. Uh, I think we're off to a good start there as well. Um, I believe uh, Mr. Reichert, uh, you're next. Uh, please proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Chairman Costa, Ranking Member Rouser, and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the invitation to testify before the committee today. My name is Kurt Reichert, and I am the Fumigation Director at Western Fumigation. I have worked for Western for over 28 years, and I have been a multi-state licensed professional applicator since 1991. I oversee the activities which I will talk about here today on a daily basis. I also work closely with many of the state and federal regulatory agencies which govern the manufacture, transportation, and use of the fumigants which are available to our industry. Quarantine inspections are a critical tool in our nation's efforts for protecting U.S. agriculture from invasive and non-native species, a program critical to the American economy. 
Western Fumigation works closely with both the United States Customs and Border Protection and the United States Department of Agriculture's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service Plant Protection Quarantine Inspectors, inspectors to help safeguard United States agriculture against the introduction of pests of significance. With regards to imports, we fumigate perishable commodities to eliminate invasive species which may have been hidden in the shipment. We also fumigate non-perishable cargo, such as imported tile, machinery, military equipments, and cocoa beans. Export treatments are frequently used for logs destined for Europe or Asia, and cars and machinery en route to Australia and New Zealand, and citrus and broccoli exported from California. Fumigation is often the only treatment method which can effectively eliminate these pests without damaging the cargo. Once an invasive species makes it into the U.S., its further spread can be devastating, costly, and unstoppable. Over the years, the United States has seen several invasive species gain a foothold, causing widespread economic damage to domestic agriculture. Most recently, we have seen the introduction and establishment of the Asian longhorn beetle, the brown marmorated stink bug, and the spotted lanternfly. These pests have caused immense damage and hardship by damaging crops and, at times, entire farms. APHIS, CBP, and the various fumigation companies which operate at our ports of entry are literally on the front lines with respect to stopping invasive species. All invasive pests can be tracked back to a port of entry where it must have slipped by undetected, possibly due to the limited number of inspectors being unable to keep up with their core mission, or with the volume of goods entering the port. CBP and APHIS personnel are true professionals and are dedicated to their core missions, but they are human and can be overtasked at times. CBP and APHIS agriculture inspectors have two powerful tools to use in the defense against invasive species. The first is by direct inspection of goods and commodities. Direct inspection is a targeted physical examination of the specified portion of cargo which might be targeted due to the possible presence of an invasive species from the exporting country or a hitchhiking pest which may have been inadvertently picked up during transit to the United States. But inspectors can only examine so many containers or vessels in a single day, and inspectors can often not physically examine every single piece of cargo in a shipment. The second tool is to require mandatory treatments for high-risk shipments. Mandatory treatments are required for imports from certain countries or regions where a known invasive pest is established and prevalent, or if a commodity is imported in such a volume as to make a thorough inspection impractical. Both of these tools require a minimum number of CBP and APHIS personnel at each port of entry. Proper staffing must be in place for inspections during the day as well as for fumigation treatments which occur after normal business hours. The increased cost of staffing will often be only a fraction of the cost of an effective eradication effort after an invasive species has become established. We urge Congress to support our land and water ports in places like Texas, North Carolina, California, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey, which stand as our nation's first and only line of defense against invasive species. Current staffing cannot reasonably be expected to be able to examine the amount of cargo they handle in a thorough manner. Treatments can be applied to cargoes from questionable regions in lieu of requiring physical inspections by APHIS or CBP personnel. This allows APHIS and CBP to be more efficient and targeted in their inspection programs until staffing is brought up to full strength. For these reasons, Western and our partner fumigation companies around the U.S. support increased APHIS and CBP staffing efforts such as House Resolutions 4482 and 3244, which will appropriate funding to better staff our ports of entry and guard American agriculture against invasive species. I want to again thank the committee for the opportunity to testify here. I have additional remarks which have been submitted to the record, and I will be happy to answer any questions which you may have. We thank you very much, uh, Mr. Reichert, for your uh, timely testimony. And our last witness, uh, before we begin uh, the question uh, period with uh, members of the subcommittee, is with Mr. Gaskamp. Please begin. Chairman Costa, Ranking Member Rousey, members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony on behalf of Noble Research Institute. Swan are not a species native to the United States. When they were introduced as livestock for human consumption, they were bred for high fertility and accelerated meat production. Unfortunately, as swine were in intentionally and unintentionally released to live in, feral, in a feral state, these same traits contributed to an uncontrolled population growth and the devastating ecological and economic impacts that I will address later in my comments. Land use changes in transportation and stocking for hunting have also contributed to population growth and geographic expansion. In the south central U.S., feral swine populations are estimated to grow at a rate of 21% per year. 
Farrell Swan are now present in at least 37 states, including the vast majority of states represented by this committee. And the total population is estimated to be more than 7 million animals. Damage caused by feral swan comes in many forms. It is widespread and extensive, but rarely rigorously quantified. Feral swan damage to U.S. agriculture is estimated to be more than $1.5 billion annually. However, this commonly cited estimate does not include many ecological damages and threats to human health. As such, it is likely the true economic damage caused by feral swine far exceeds $1.5 billion. Examples of impacts on cultivated crops appear regularly, including the 2006 E. coli outbreak in California's spinach, in which feral swine were responsible. It was estimated that spinach farms in California lost as much as $75 million due to public fears of consuming spinach. Other crops commonly impacted by feral swine include small grains, fruits, beans, potatoes, and nuts. Feral swine also regularly mingle with cattle, utilizing common water sources and feed stations and rooting and defecating in cattle enclosures. They interact with domestic swine in non-confinement pork facilities. These interactions result in livestock exposure to more than 60 infectious diseases that cause weight loss, abortions, and death in domestic livestock. Specifically, feral swine commonly harbor brucellosis, pseudorabies, and African swine fever, or ASF. To maintain brucellosis-free status for cattle in the global market, any time a cow tests positive for brucella, an epidemiologic investigation is required at considerable government expense. Similarly, an occurrence of ASF in U.S. livestock would result in substantial losses to the industry from international markets. Feral swine also threaten native wildlife populations, including numerous endangered species. They compete for food, destroy habitat, and predate on these species. Entire native ecosystems are impacted by the presence of feral swine. Rooting accelerates the establishment and spread of invasive plants, decreasing diversity and resilience of these ecosystems. Feral swine must be controlled to protect our nation's agricultural resources. Studies have shown that 70% of the feral swine population must be removed annually to halt population growth. Unfortunately, most conventional trap methods remove less than 50% of the population. Moreover, research suggests that conventional traps may actually be responsible for creating what is commonly known today as trap-shy pigs. Noble Research Institute has investigated strategies to capture trap-shy pigs. The result of this research is a fully suspended trap that functions much differently than conventional traps. Our research demonstrates that the suspended trap design has an 88% capture rate, and it is, commercial, it is now commercially available under the Boarbuster product name. Innovate, innovative techniques like the Boarbuster will be essential to controlling feral swine populations as they become more trap-shy. Education on best management practices that utilize the most effective technologies in a strategic manner is vital to successfully reducing feral swine populations. State and federal funding has extended the reach of producer education on feral swine, but more educational programs are needed as feral swine populations expand. Funding for continued research is also vital to future success in feral swine control. Stimulated by the USDA-funded grant in 2015, the National Wildlife Research Center and Noble Research Institute partnered to develop performance and monitoring tools for the management of feral swine. We anticipate the, U, that USDA's new feral swine control pilot will result in additional innovative ideas for educating producers and increasing control efforts. Feral swine populations continue to grow at the expense of ag production and native ecosystems. If left unchecked, feral swine could have devastating impacts on our nation's food supply, <coughs> ag industry sustainability, and environment. Continued support for developing advanced control strategies, conducting feral swine research, and educating producers on strategic and effective control practices is essential if we hope to prevail over this invasive and prolific species. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. We thank you, uh, Mr. Gaskamp, for your uh, important testimony. And uh, I've noticed that we've been joined by the chairman of the House Agriculture Committee, and uh, appropriately so, we will defer to him for any comments or questions he may want to make at this time. Thank you, Chairman Costa. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Thompson, uh, welcome. Uh, I haven't had a chance to interact with you uh, directly in, in this position. Um, I've had a lot of experience with your predecessors who did outstanding jobs, and I, I'm told that you're going to be better than they are. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but Minnesota's um, you know, been a leader, I think, in a lot of different areas. The poultry situation, uh, as you mentioned, 
um, we learned a lot of lessons. And I guess you were the head of the Wilmer Lab at one point, were you? Yes, members, uh, Minnesota has two labs. One yeah. is located in, in St. Paul and one in Wilmer, which was well-funded after avian influenza. Yeah, yes. and, and uh, that was because of, you know, we learned our lesson, and we had people taking uh, turkeys to um, South Dakota to get them tested because we couldn't, you know, they couldn't deal with it all, the, the distances and all that. So I think we made a lot of progress, and we learned a lot about biosecurity. And we thought we had a pretty good system, and turned out we didn't. You know, we had people working at six different turkey farms that were staying together <laughs> at right. night and not showering and whatever and spreading this stuff, you know. So we learned a lot of things. And, um, you know, I think the industry is pretty much on top of it now as best as you can be. Uh, the one question I have is, uh, as I understand it, the hog industry is kind of learned from what turkeys went through and are upgrading their biosecurity uh, to make sure you don't have the same kind of things going on within the hog industry. Is, am I right about that? Yeah, um, Mr. Chair, members, that is very correct. Uh, in Minnesota, we've stood up uh, additional committees taking a look at, and, and the, the disease of interest right now is African swine fever, right. but it could be foot and mouth disease. It could be any of a number of diseases. But yes, they're taking a look at all the things that have been learned in avian influenza, specifically biosecurity, but also surveillance, also, you know, some of those other things that need to be in place. But as I understand, you know, this, the avian uh, influenza thing went pretty fast. As I understand, the African swine fever is a slower-moving virus, so I guess it has the potential to get ahead of it to like, easier than it, avian influenza is. Am I correct about that? That, that is a correct statement, uh, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, the unfortunate thing about the way our hog production happens in the United States, though, is there is much more movement of hogs than there is turkeys, chickens, eggs. So if it's slow moving and there aren't clinical signs, there might be movement of the disease prior to we knowing about it. Yeah. So. Well, well they're, I think they're trying to do everything they can to get on top of it. Uh, and a lot of people aren't aware, we had a TB outbreak uh, up north uh, that got transferred from deer to cattle. Uh, and we had to go in and do a quarantine. Uh, we basically took a 30 square mile area. Your predecessor, the state vet and the uh, federal vet were involved. And a bunch of us, we made a decision to eradicate all the deer within 30 miles. We put helicopters in there and killed every deer. And we got, got it under control and we eradicated it, you know, you know, I don't know how long it took, a couple, three years. Michigan didn't do that, and they still have TB because they didn't do what needed to be done at the time when it broke out, and now they can't get ahead of it. So that's another example of why you have to be on the ball with this stuff. Uh, the other thing that troubles me about your testimony here, you say that there's two leadership positions that are vacant at USDA APHIS. You know, we put extra money into this um, in the Farm Bill why are these positions vacant? Do you have any idea? Uh, Mr. Chair, members, I am not sure why those two positions are currently vacant. There has been some switch up in positions in veterinary services, as you all may know. Uh, Dr. Shear has moved into a different position. We now have Dr. Burke Healy heading up veterinary services. So there's been some movement, but we are, the states are, are looking at those two positions. We would like to have those filled as soon as possible. Can you see any, uh, at this point, any outcome out of this 300 million that we put in there? Or have you seen any upgrade in what's going on with APHIS from your position? Uh, Mr. Chair, members, the, if, if you're speaking specifically of the Farm Bill funding, there was a call for proposals for training and exercise for this first year and all states uh, related agencies, uh, some universities and some private groups have put in uh, proposals for that money, so we're waiting to hear back from USDA at this point in time. We're very excited about this opportunity. And uh, Mr. Uh, Guestcamp, is it? Um, in, over in Denmark, they're, they're building a wall. Now, we're into walls in this world, but they're building a wall between Denmark and Germany. I actually saw the video of it uh, because the feral hogs in Germany apparently have African swine fever. And the industry in Denmark is scared to death that they're going to transfer these. They're actually building a double wall so that these hogs can't interact face to face. <laughs> you know, um, do I, I don't know that we have 
any indication that we've got African swine fever within the feral hog population of the United States. Um, I guess one question if you're aware of that. And the second thing is, how would the feral hog population acquire African swine fever? Do you have any, any, any information about that? Or do any of you have any information? I guess. Um, absolutely. Thank you for the question. Um, Af African swine fever um, in countries where, uh, or in countries where African swine fever is endemic, it persists in native populations of, of wild pigs as well as feral swine that are in those areas. Um, here in the United States, until we can really get a hold of, of actually controlling feral swine populations, we won't be able to have a good way to control African swine fever. Um, if it gets into feral swine populations. I am not an epidemiologist, so I don't know exactly how feral swine would get the disease, but they definitely can contract it from domestic livestock and vice versa. Does anybody on the panel know uh, how that would, could possibly happen if it, it could get transferred into the wild population? Uh, Mr. Chair, members, one of the pathways that I can think of is uh, African swine fever virus is very hardy. So if you think you're cooking it with salamis and different dried meats or cured meats, you might not actually be killing the virus. And if somebody throws out a sandwich that has uh, some African swine fever infected meat in it and feral swine get a hold of it, that would be one pathway. But we don't have African swine fever in the United States at this point that we know of. Right. Correct. That is correct, Mr. So Chair. So how could it get... So I know we've up, up the things at the border and so forth, <clears throat> trying to stop this stuff from China, but how would it... You know, I, I guess that's one way. I guess it, it would have to get in almost into the domestic population first before it got into the feral swine population, I would guess, right? Uh, Mr. Chair, members, yes, that's probably the most... most hmm. Well, I've taken more sense. time than I should, but uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for your uh, testimony, and I yield back. All right, uh, we thank Chairman Peterson for your focus and uh, always your uh, uh, insight as to um, the challenges we're facing on these issues and others. Uh, I'd like to begin um, with the uh, witness from, um, from uh, California, Mr. Ortega. Uh, you noted in your testimony about the challenges you're facing with this uh, uh, invasive non-native species called nutria that's also been uh, um, a problem in other parts of the country. Um, my understanding is you have funding for eradication for two years, but what happens uh, after that? Uh, a, a serious deficit. Um, so uh, no, no long-term funding has been secured. Um, we think the effort uh, will require about $5 million annually. Um, Five million uh, so currently will support 45 staff um, uh, at, at the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And the source of that funding is? Um, the uh, San Joaquin Delta Conservancy um, has, uh, has issued a, a one-time appropriation in, in the amount of $10 million. Um, uh, uh, CDFW is also reallocating staff, biologists, um, uh, to, to this effort. Uh, so th those folks should be doing their, their, their normal day-to-day -day jobs. But, um, uh, yeah, I fear that if, if we don't secure some long-term funding, um, we're going to have a, a, a real hard time controlling this outbreak. And are you aware of the experiences in Maryland and Louisiana and their eradication efforts and what sources of funding that they were able to bring together? Yeah, there, there was actually federal funding available um, here in the east uh, that, that currently did not extend uh, to, to California um, through the eradication program. Um, the, well, that's I something I think we ought to look at uh, in terms of a comprehensive effort. Uh, if it's applicable in Maryland and Louisiana, obviously we think it would be appropriate in California. Uh, and, you know, a lot of these efforts are a result of cost sharing anyway, local, state, and federal. So we should work on that. Um, you noted in your testimony, again, the impacts on waterways uh, and levees uh, and the importance of those waterways to deliver water to uh, <clears throat> um, agriculture and urban water users. Uh, could you talk more specifically, have you had any cost analysis on potential impacts in agriculture? 
Uh, no specific cost analysis have been conducted. Um, the, the Central Valley is a very flat area, um, and uh, most of the water is, is wheeled uh, through earthen line uh, canals. Um, uh, and so the, the extensive burrowing that, that can occur can, can really compromise. I understand it's hundreds of feet, and they establish these caves within these levees in which you'll have colonies of nutria that begin breeding, as you noted, after four months, and with That's 40 right. offspring, it, it, uh, the propagation of this species obviously is very problematic. Absolutely, yeah. The uh, the burrowing is extensive, and, and because of the uh, the density in these colonies, um, one example is they they pulled a uh, hundred nutria out of a ten acre pond. Um, so they they're, they're very gregarious, and and they can attack you know specific infrastructure. Um, if if we don't start to get control of these, and they they do migrate into the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta, I think that's the the, the biggest biggest uh, threat. Uh, that, that agricultural faces. Um, the, the Delta is a, a highly managed system um, that, to provide water uh, throughout the state. Well, uh, Mr. Harder has legislation on that effort, uh, of which I'm a co-sponsor and will continue to work with him. Hopefully he'll get back here before uh, the uh, committee uh, finishes its hearing. Um, Mr. Erickson and, and Mr. Reichert, uh, you talked uh, about the importance of the impact of trade, and I noted that in my opening comments. Uh, I think we all here in the subcommittee believe that that's absolutely critical, uh, and that to ensure that we have enough resources in our ports uh, so that inspections are done thoroughly, that was part of the problem I had with this tomato seed issue in China, where we had to try to provide some alternative support um, and, and I think that's why, as you all noted, that uh, in, uh, Mr. Vela's legislation that, that many of us are co-sponsoring to introduce Protecting America's Food and Agriculture Act to make sure that we can hire more ag inspectors uh, at our ports of entry. What kind of backlog are you folks seeing uh, due to the lack of inspectors, and what impact does that have on specialty crop growers and consumers? So it's not uncommon for us. So we're a domestic producer, um, but we do import product to complement our, our business. And, and um, we, I would say once a month on average, perhaps, a couple times a month, we run into issues where um, a, a load of cilantro or broccoli crowns or something coming out of Mexico um, gets held up at the port of entry because of uh, insect identification, and the local inspectors uh, may not have the authority to identify that insect, so then the insect needs to be sent up to Washington, D.C. So it takes maybe, you know, occasionally we see shipments that may take three to four to five days uh, to receive an, uh, an insect identification and when it's something that's out of the ordinary. At which time we typically would have to dump the load or send it to the food bank. It would no longer be salvageable for us. Um, so more, it's not, more examples it, of that will be important as we try to move this legislation forward. Mr. Right. Riker, do you, briefly, do you have anything uh, you'd like to add? Um, no. To follow up on Mr. Erickson's uh, experiences, we see about the same in, in the Port of Philadelphia. Uh, generally, we handle more of the imported commodities. Um, our CBP inspector staff is down by, I believe, four inspectors. Um, our APHIS inspector count is generally at six. Uh, we understand they are losing two uh, of their people through a vertical um, integration. So uh, they have offers out there now for additional inspectors. Uh, two would be the minimal. Um, as Mr. Erickson said, the identifiers are also in need. Uh, certain commodities, if they cannot be inspected or identified locally, must be sent down to uh, Baltimore area, and that can in the... Uh, uh, Bottom line is we need more help. Yes, we do. Okay. Um, I've exceeded my time, and I'd like to defer now to the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Rouser from North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, thank each of you uh, for being here uh, today. Um, we're talking about uh, feral swine and their ability to harbor uh, any number of diseases. Do we know exactly how many different diseases uh, they can harbor? Is it thousands, hundreds of thousands, 10, 20? Uh, we, you know, that's a, that's a great question, uh, Ranking Member Rouser. Um, we 
we don't know exactly how many how many diseases swine can actually harbor. Uh, we know there are about 66 that are important to agriculture here in the U.S. Um, that doesn't include some of the foreign animal diseases like foot and mouth and uh, African swine fever. Um, but it's a, a, a funny story is, you know, we, we work with a colleague out, at, uh, out in western Texas um, at the Texas Institute for Environmental and Human Health. Um, he's been very good at exploring new diseases that may be harbored in our swine populations. And every time he, he sends us some advice, hey, maybe we ought to start testing for this. It seems that we find some prevalence of every disease we've tested for in feral swine. They are a huge reservoir. Um, for, for diseases that, you know, could, could harm U.S. agriculture. You know, following up on that, um, there's a great movement in the country, uh, free-range chickens, free-range hogs, uh, whatever you want to call it, in this case, feral. Uh, I have a huge population center on the coast, and then further inland, it's all agriculture, and I have a tremendous number of hogs, turkeys, and chickens that are produced in my district. And it, Invariably, every single week when I'm back home, I have two or three uh, folks who will come up to me and say, you know, I just really don't like the way that uh, American agriculture, uh, these fact factory farms, all these hogs put together, all these chickens put together, all these turkeys put together, how inhumane it is and, and everything else. Uh, it seems to me that we need to do a better job of talking about uh, uh, the risk, you know, with this movement out there uh, to move to backyard uh, production agriculture. There is, after all, a reason why we moved away from it. Uh, economics is part of it, uh, but uh, in sophistication and new techniques and, and, and new developments, et cetera. Uh, but uh, in your circles, is anybody uh, you know, talking about this movement and, and the um, uh, potential impact in terms of promoting uh, and having an environment where you have even more infectious diseases that are much more difficult to control? Uh, absolutely. Um, ranking member Rouser, we've, uh, you know, in in you know the domestication process of of many of these livestock species, we incorporate these you know proper animal husbandry practices, and and uh, you know the you know, we haven't spoke a lot on wildlife species, but those wildlife species do wildlife species don't have those animal husbandry practices that protect them. Um, when you take livestock species and move them out into more free range type scenarios, you're putting them more at risk, just like you like those wildlife species that are out there. Yeah. Uh, for my education and to my knowledge, uh, uh, swine fever has no impact on human health. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. It, it it affects only species of swine. There are no other species infected, uh, including humans. Can the human body be a carrier of it, I assume? Like uh, all of us, I assume, have some type of dormant virus that we carry, uh, although it may not show up. Uh, that's an excellent question. No, the human body wouldn't be a carrier itself other than if there is some sort of virus that's picked up on clothing, on shoes, on things like that. But the body itself, no, the human body would not accept that virus. Okay. So when you mentioned uh, earlier um, today in the hearing uh, where you throw out food that may be contaminated with swine fever, assuming that food is uh, digested, or ingested by the human body, uh, it, it has no effect. Mr. Chair, yes, thanks for that clarification. No, it wouldn't be the humans eating the African swine fever. It would be a human having a sandwich that contains some of the virus and not eating the sandwich and throwing it out to the pigs. Right, but in terms of that portion of the sandwich the human ate, no, it does not stay in the human body. Correct. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Uh, one quick uh, last thing, um, Mr. Reichert, uh, there's a bill in Congress, as you may know, to ban the use of uh, uh, chlorpyrifos, and if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it's a common, uh, obviously a common insecticide that's, uh, that's used. Uh, there are 115 co-sponsors, including some members of the, this committee that are on that bill. Uh, is there a real problem with the EPA in terms of uh, risk assessment, et cetera, as it relates to that uh, insect insecticide? Uh, Ranking Member Rouser, unfortunately, I do not know the answer to that. Um, my division specifies fumigation only. Uh, we do have a pest control division, so I could get that answer, but uh, I do not know that. Okay. Thank you. I yield back.
<clears throat> thank the ranking member and uh, the uh, next uh, member on uh, our list here is uh, Congressman Harder from uh, uh, just north of me and the great uh, San Juan King Valley and he has a piece of legislation that I think deals with one of these issues that we were talking about earlier on non-native invasive species. Congressman Harder. Uh, thank you Chairman Costa and Ranking Member Rouser. I appreciate the opportunity to testify about the threat Nutria poses to the California Central Valley, and I especially want to thank Congressman Costa for identifying ways USDA and the California Fish and Wildlife Service can, can work together to contain and eradicate these swamp rats. Uh, for folks who have no idea what a Nutria is, all you need to know is this is a giant swamp rat which can destroy vital, vitally important parts of our agriculture, everything from crops, including almond trees, uh, irrigation canals. They can even cause flooding by burrowing into water control systems and threatening our water infrastructure. And if we don't take action now, there could be 250,000 nutria just in California within five years because one female can lead to 200 offspring in a year, 200. Uh, and that's why I've introduced, introduced a bill that invests $7 million now to help our community and our country get ahead of this issue before it's too late. And to illustrate this, I brought this fantastic prop, which is called the Invasion Curve, uh, thanks to the uh, California Fish and Wildlife Service. I call it the Nutria Curve. We can also call it the, the Feral Hog Curve, but we'll talk about that. And essentially what you see here is you see the exponential growth of an invasive species. You see that at the beginning, uh, you have the introduction of an invasive species, you see the first detection, then you see when folks are aware, uh, and then when public awareness begins, and then finally when uh, eradication is all but impossible, when all you can do is have local control and management. And this is the costs uh, of containment, are obviously also exponential as the population grows. This is where we are right now on Nutria. We're right here. Uh, we've detected the problem, but eradication is still feasible. If we don't combat this problem quickly, pretty soon we're going to be right here. By the time that public awareness really, in, uh, really begins, by the time you see these Nutria uh, all up in your farm, it's already too late to eradicate the problem completely. Uh, and the, you see the exact same thing, by the way, with what's happened in feral hogs. I think feral hogs are actually a, an example uh, of, of not taking this as seriously as we should have at the beginning. I mean, in the 1980s, wild pigs were where Nutria is today, only found in a handful of states. But today, they're found in 35 states, costing $2.5 billion in damage annually. Uh, some farmers in southern states lose up to 50% of their yield just from these pigs. And you know, folks have to worry about 30 to 50 feral hogs in their backyard attacking their kids. Uh, and so the Farm Bill you know, has set aside $75 million over five years to address this crisis. Uh, but I wish uh, what we would have done is actually addressed it years earlier, decades earlier, when it was still uh, easier to eradicate it. And so my goal is to make Nutria uh, not the next feral ho hog infestation. We come from a state where there's a lot of droughts, floods, wildfires. We need to be able to get ahead of disasters, and invasive species are, are just the next one. And I hear a lot of my colleagues talk about fiscal responsibility, and I couldn't agree more. By getting ahead of this problem now, when it's still manageable, we're spending $7 million to eradicate this problem instead of spending $2.5 billion every single year like we are on federal hogs, on, on feral hogs. Uh, we actually end up saving a whole lot of money by, uh, in, the, in the long run before they actually get out of control. And I want to thank uh, the administration for taking this issue very seriously, working with my office to identify a bipartisan bill that addresses this serious uh, problem. And I also want to thank the Ag Committee for holding this hearing on this vitally important issue. We need to make sure, because the challenge here, just the last point I'd make, is that by the time public awareness begins, eradication is very unlikely. And by the time folks really uh, understand the depth of this problem, eradication is actually all but impossible. And so we have to get started now uh, when we're seeing these invasive swamp rats all over. I mean, these things can go up to 30, 40, 50 pounds. They're huge. Uh, and one female, 200 offsprings, we've got to be able to nip it in the bud. Uh, so with that, I, I yield back my time. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and, and Ranking Member. And I look forward to uh, hopefully getting our bill across the finish line. Well, uh, we look forward to working with you. Uh, before um, um, uh, I asked questions of uh, uh, 
Mr. Ortega, uh, who's dealing specifically with the problem in our area, and uh, the uh, example of the infestation in, in Maryland and in Louisiana uh, resulted in federal funding to match state and local, and so it's appropriate. There's a, a precedent there, and uh, I intend to work with you and I hope other committee members to uh, move on this legislation working with the uh, Department of Agriculture because it is a very serious issue, as you noted. Okay, uh, our uh, next uh, witness uh, is uh, DeJardin. Uh, no, let's see. Ah, my glasses on. Comer. Comer, I'm sorry, uh, DeJardin is from uh, Kentucky. Thank you, Mr. Comer. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Chairman, and I wanted to begin with talking about the feral hogs as well. I uh, represent Southern Kentucky and uh, Western Kentucky along the Mississippi River, and the mindset in Kentucky is those feral hogs are just concentrated along the Mississippi River area. Uh, my farms are about four hours east of there, and my brother killed one uh, on his farm last year. Uh, it also wanted to note that just this week, the uh, there was an announcement that the Kentucky Division of Fish and Wildlife will join the Forest Service in uh, an, an attempt to uh, kill the feral hogs from, from helicopters. And there was a picture of, uh, I know they had done that before in Kentucky. So uh, Kentucky is, is serious about it. I was Commissioner of Agriculture, and this was a, a big issue in, in several counties along the Mississippi and, and Ohio River parts of, of Kentucky. Um, I was just curious is that, uh, I guess I'll ask Mr. Gaskamp, is, is that something that uh, other states are doing working with the fish and wildlife to try to eradicate uh, the feral hog population? And is that proved to be a, a good relationship in, in every state? Uh, thank you for the question. A absolutely, uh, you know, collaboration is key um, in w when dealing with feral swine, collaboration is key uh, to Get behind the problem. Get ahead. Of, get ahead of the problem. You know, there are aer aerial gunning is that practice what, mm -hmm. that we refer to as you know as basically wildlife services, USDA right. wildlife services, getting in helicopters and administering control, uh, lethal control via helicopters. Right. Uh, that is happening in a lot of states in the South, uh, Texas and Oklahoma. Um, it, Kansas have very active programs where wildlife services is flying and, um, and, and working on eradication in that, in that regard. Um, in a couple of those states, in Texas and Oklahoma, we actually have uh, commercial, uh, commercial operators that are also uh, you know, selling um, hunts from, from helicopters and, and that sort of thing for the public to engage in. Mm -hmm. Uh, aerial gunning has been proven to be one of those more effective techniques uh, for removing swine, um, but those techniques need to be strategic in nature, um, designed as, at designed for control, not for recreation. Right. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Thompson, I wanted to ask you, uh, in my district we have five poultry processors. I think I have as big a poultry uh, dependent district as, as any in America, in, in Kentucky. Uh, what's the status of programs to safeguard the, the health of poultry to prevent uh, you know, any type of livestock disease outbreak? How successful uh, are we right now? I know there have been instances, even in Kentucky and other states, where you've had an outbreak of West Nile and, and uh, different things like that. And, and uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair, members. There, there is a, a lot of work going on within our poultry industries right now. I'm most familiar with what's going on in Minnesota, of course, but uh, on the level of biosecurity, the lessons mm -hmm. learned from high path avian influenza in the past years. In addition to that, uh, all poultry processors are working together with their producers on biosecurity audits. Mm -hmm. And as an official state agency, we're reviewing the audits of individual farms. So on many different levels, there's, there's a lot of work going on right now. Uh, my last question I wanted to ask uh, you, Dr. Thompson, pertained to black vultures. This has been a huge issue in Kentucky uh, with my cattlemen. Uh, the, uh, of course, that was a protected species. We changed that. So I assume we changed that in the Farm Bill. It was supposed to be changed in, in the Farm Bill uh, last year. What uh, what success has Minnesota had, if, very quickly, what success has Minnesota had with dealing with black vultures? 
and, and I'm, uh, I'm afraid I'd have to look into that. I'm not aware of okay. any issues with black vultures in okay. Minnesota. Okay, all right. Well, uh, I'll just conclude with a statement here. Uh, one concern that I hear from uh, constituents and agencies overseeing the vulture issue in Kentucky, which is a huge issue with, uh, with livestock producers, is that the federal government is, is not the most helpful when it comes to this. I know that uh, that may come as a surprise to many of my farmer friends, but I hear from several cattle producers that uh, Fish and Wildlife Services keeps USDA and landowners from being able to manage this problem independently from the government. Um, and, you know, this is a classic example of government getting in the way of, of, uh, of its own way. And I believe this is an issue with a, with a simple solution. I hope we can resolve it with a, uh, in, a, in a fast way. But I believe that uh, farmers would be the best people to be able to resolve this issue uh, on their farms. And I hope that's something that we can uh, talk about as we move forward in trying to eradicate predatory species, especially the, the black vultures. But, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, my time is out. I yield back. All right. I thank the gentleman. And uh, I'll now uh, uh, refer to the gentlewoman from the wonderful state of Connecticut, uh, Representative Hayes. Thank you, Chairman Costa, for holding this important hearing. And thank you to all the witnesses for being here today. Um, I don't have a visual, but I look forward to working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to get ahead of eradicating these species that are damaging uh, many of our agricultural sectors. In Connecticut, my district in particular, it's home to a variety of greenhouses and poultry farms. According to the USDA, the greenhouse industry is the fastest growing agricultural sector in my state. The value of this sector to Connecticut's economy is estimated at $3.5 billion, according to the Uni University of Connecticut. There are roughly 10.5 million square feet of greenhouse space in Connecticut that is used to cultivate climate-controlled food crops, bedding plants, seasonal plants, vegetables, and herb plants. When it comes to poultry, Connecticut always leads the way. Henry Saglio, a pioneer in the poultry industry, hailed from Connecticut. He's a global leader in the industry and owner of Arbor Acres Chicken Farms. At Arbor Acres, he developed breeding chickens for the world and played a pivotal role in making chicken America's most consumed meat. His chickens would go on to be associated with products ranging from Campbell's Soup to Purdue. Not surprisingly, for a time, chicken were the state's main export. In keeping in line with our rich history in poultry, the College of Agriculture, Health, and Natural Resources at the University of Connecticut has a poultry farm and resource unit within their School of Animal Health. For these reasons, it is particularly important to me to work diligently to help farmers protect their poultry and greenhouses against wild, invasive, and non-native species. With that in mind, I would like to discuss greenhouses and then shift to poultry. So, Mr. Reichert, my district is a major producer of nursery greenhouse and floricultural products. At Western Fumigation, how do you address pest, pest risks for imports? And are they handled in the same way for fruits and other products? And then finally, are there any special considerations given to food versus non-food products? Yes, thank you, Representative Hayes. Uh, as far as the pest risk assessment, those are generally handled through the USDA. Um, anytime a new product or country wants to bring a new product into the U.S., they do have to apply for clearance. Uh, USDA will issue a pest risk assessment, which will be put out to industry for comment, um, after which they will assign certain treatments based on the risk of an imported product. And it can be an edible commodity or non-edible commodity. Uh, generally, they just deal with the edible commodities. Uh, most of the non-commodities uh, are inspected prior to admission. Thank you. Dr. Thompson, your state has a vibrant poultry sector as well. We are located east of you, and as you discussed earlier, uh, diseases spread by migratory birds, they tend to go west to east. How do you coordinate with other state veterinarians in, say, New England? so that those of us on the Atlantic Flyway can stay up to date and prepare for what's heading our way. 
Thank you for that question, Mr. Chair. Members, uh, there is a variety of different ways that we communicate across states. Uh, most importantly, I would bring up United States Animal Health Association. Uh, it's an association of all state regulatory officials and specifically animal health officials. As part of that organization, we also have the National Assembly, which is made up of only state animal health officials. Certainly, my, in, in my view, the, the best way to communicate with each other is picking up the telephone and calling somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> um, do you see the USC take, USDA taking a leadership role in convening some sort of discussions around those air, like communication uh, best practices to make sure that we're ahead of any potential outbreaks or spreads? Yes, that's a very good question. USDA does convene meetings on an ongoing basis depending on the disease and depending on the species. Thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Uh, Chairman Costa. I yield back. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Representative uh, Hayes. Uh, our next uh, member is uh, the gentleman from in Minnesota, Mr. Hagedorn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Rouser. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank the witnesses for their testimony. First, I'd like to associate myself with uh, Ranking Member Rouser's comments about everything that you're doing is very important, but the number one uh, important thing for agriculture right now is to get the uh, United States, Mexico, Canada free trade agreement through. It's very critical. It's gonna help us build momentum for other deals with China and others. And I say, if we can't get a deal done with our best friends to the North and South, who expects the president and others to get something done with China? So to, to my thinking, that's the, that has to be the focus of this committee and everyone else as we move out of here. Uh, Mr. Gascam. So we've had people from agriculture and others come up and talk with us about uh, African swine fever, and I've always impressed upon them. We should probably be doing more like they do in other countries, like Taiwan, to try to keep products out of their country coming from China. We even have a, a situation now where people uh, check the box with customs and border, border security to say they've been on hog farms in China. They fly into our country. They're not even sometimes talked to, or let alone uh, investigated to see if they have any products or anything that would cause harm to us. Chairman Peterson brought up the point, though, about how would it get in the country, and we've talked about that. But I said, you know, it's one thing to try to protect the United States from African swine fever, but what about Mexico and Canada, particularly Mexico? Have a bit of a porous border there. Is it possible that uh, we could get it just from these feral hogs uh, you know, being infected in Mexico running over the border? I take it that they, they don't really pay attention to our borders, correct? Uh, thank you for the question. That that is correct. Uh, you know, we we've done research just in just in. I mean, Oklahoma Texas border is not the same border as the Texas as the U.S. Mexico border. But feral swine do not pay attention to boundaries, especially water boundaries. Um, feral swine, fortunately, they do. You know, contrary to a lot of popular belief, feral swine do have home ranges. They don't just. They're not nomadic, roaming the landscape endlessly. Um, the most of their Geographic expansion has been a product of recreational hunting, increasing populations in areas for recreational hunting. Um, and so fortunately, um, an effort like that to keep, you know, if, if African swine or fever were to get into Mexico, for example, um, we could focus efforts along that border in order to keep it from moving. Um, now, we, you know, you still got the issue of transportation on shoes and, and baloney sure. and all of those things. But That's good to know. Thank you. Dr. Thompson, nice to, nice to see you today. Thank you for being here. So if, uh, if we ended up with a case of uh, African swine fever in the state of Minnesota, which we hope never happens, it would be pretty devastating, right? We'd have, it wouldn't just be our hog farmers, but it would be our crop farmers, our grain farmers, the implement dealers, seed corn, everybody. It would be devastating to our economy. If that happened, though, I take it you have a plan, or you've been working with people that have a plan on how to contain it, uh, can you share a little bit about that and who you might be working with in other states or the federal government in order to implement that? Yes, thank you for that question, members. Uh, boy, that I, I could go on for a long time to talk about how much planning we've we'll been going through. Minute 38. Minute 38. <laughs> 
We, we uh, certainly, we've got uh, a variety of different committees that we've set up within the state. And very importantly, when you talk about hog production, it's not only about production within the state, but our, our systems that are, our hog systems that are located in Minnesota have connections and move pigs and move feed and move sows and move all sorts of things with other states. So what we're looking at that this as is a regional approach. So we've pulled in, importantly, Iowa, but also other states within our region to start talking about and continuing to work on our plans of what's going to happen. In addition to that, very recently, there was a nationwide ASF exercise, which I believe was 15 states uh, highly involved with hog production were involved with. Uh, it was a three-day exercise. We looked at things like what does a stop movement mean? How are we going to permit things from state to state? And some of those important issues. But I can tell you at any point in time uh, during the week there is something going on within the Minnesota Board of Animal Health related to African swine fever. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back, and the uh, next uh, uh, member on the list is uh, Ms. Hartzeller from Missouri, right? Yes, absolutely. The Show Me State. That's right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gascap, uh, and all of you for being here. I uh, grew up on a hog farm, uh, so very, very supportive of pork production and very concerned about the feral swine uh, issue that is all across our country, even in uh, my district, uh, part of South Missouri there. So I'm very interested in your, your testimony. Um, you talked about the effectiveness of the boar buster uh, suspended trap system. I've had a chance to see that. Our Missouri Department of Conservation is recommending that as the uh, eradication method. Um, they are opposed to the hunting uh, that some people are, are doing. What is your opinion about hunting? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, specific to feral swine, um, you know, I, I'm a hunter, and feral pigs are fun to hunt. Mm -hmm. uh, they really are. And um, how, however, the, the cultural mindset around hunting for that particular species, for feral swine in particular, has increased its abundance. Just like conservation efforts for native wildlife species, we promote populations from hunting. Um, the, the same, th that mentality that's gone into feral swine management where, you know, why would I travel eight hours across the country to go on a pig hunt when I can own them, own them right here in my backyard or hunt them right here in my backyard? That mentality has increased populations across the country. Um, hunting still proves to be an effective control strategy in very limited cases where populations are very small. But we don't, in general, we do not consider hunting a population control method. Yes. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that toxicants are being used in other countries, uh, but yet you say that we need more federal funding to contribute to research on toxicants. So how come we can't just use uh, toxicants that other countries are using? Uh, well, so, so right now Australia is using toxicants for feral swine. They have about as many feral swine as they have people in the, in, 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 on the continent. Um, they are, there's, there's a, a number of toxicants that we have been testing here in the United States. The primary challenges associated with toxicants are making those uh, safe and safe uh, for humans to use, uh, but more importantly, um, making them species specific so they don't affect, they, they don't affect other species, including humans, you know. So if a toxicant is, is administered, um, it, we can't be impacting native native populations of, okay. of wildlife. So, so you would say that the ones being used in Australia aren't really uh, researched enough to make sure that they're safe for humans D and other species. Sure. D differences in Australia are they don't have a lot of omnivorous species. In the United States, we do. The omnivorous species Australia has are also other invasive species. Okay. Um, in the U.S., we've got black bears that, that could be impacted as well as others. Last question with the feral swine. Uh, as you mentioned in your testimony, they're most prolific large animal in the United States. Uh, early age of sexual maturity, six to eight months, short gestation period, only 115 days, the ability for year-round breeding and, and farrowing. Uh, I've heard there's been some efforts uh, trying to look at sterilization. And um, can you talk to those efforts and trying to stop? I, I'm not aware of any 
particular reproductive inhibitors is mm -hmm. the terminology we use in that in that space. Uh, I'm not familiar with any reproductive inhibitors that are that are available or close to being available. Mm -hmm. They pose a lot of the same risks or challenges that toxicants do, making them specific to feral swine only. Um, and and there is but there is work being done in several universities across the South uh, trying to identify and develop those reproductive inhibitors. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Reichert. I was interested in your testimony about the the fumigants and. Um, the testing that is important as we come into the ports. Um, I, I was just wondering from a practical standpoint, uh, can something be considered organic if it has been fumigated? Uh, thank you for the question, but no, there are no uh, fumigants that are approved for use on organics. So is that an issue with the growing demand for organics? Is, are we exposing ourselves to risk? bringing in fruits and vegetables from other countries, not fumigating them and bringing them in? That certainly is a risk. Uh, the USDA does tend to focus on those for inspection when they come in, but again, they only inspect a certain amount of each lot of uh, produce that's brought in, so they're not inspecting every single piece and things can be missed. Just uh, how much does it cost to fumigate one uh, container? Uh, it's generally between the $500 to $1,000 range for our charges and then our additional charges for uh, the USDA. Okay, great. Thank you very much for the information. I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back, and uh, our next uh, uh, member is um, Mr. Marshall from Kansas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I think my question is going to be directed to Mr. Gaskamp and Mr. Ortega, I, I'm guessing. So my concern is about a different invasive species. It's a plant invasive species. And I see you both have some grassland expertise. In Kansas, our major rivers are lined with salt cedars. At least that's what we local is, locals call them. Each salt cedar uh, soaks up hundreds, maybe thousands of gallons of waters per day. I think of um, Rattlesnake Creek, which flows into the Covira Wildlife Refuge. And we're having some flow issues in that particular creek. I think of the Arkansas River. Uh, some people call it the Arkansas River, but we call it the Arkansas River. It flows out of Colorado and across Kansas, and large portions of that river typically doesn't have water in it anymore. And it's also lined with salt cedars. Um, throughout the prairies now, grasslands, traditional red cedars have taken over many, many areas. I've talked to farmers who have mowed down, salt, uh, mowed down cedars and creeks that had never ran before started running again. Any, any experience uh, on the impact of these on, on the water and long-term solutions? You know, we mow the salt cedars down. It's really expensive to do. They grow back. Uh, Josh, uh, Mr. Gaskamp, any experience with salt cedars and red cedars? Uh, thank you for the question. I have limited experience. Uh, I've got more experience with uh, eastern red cedar. It is a native plant that is encroaching on rangelands across uh, the southern Great Plains. Um, we consider it invasive because it was, you know, back in history, it was relegated to uh, steep, steep drainages and things like that. The suppression right. of prescribed fire um, has brought on that species, has, has grown the potential um, for it to invade grasslands. Um, and so there's a, there is movement um, in, you know, in, in a lot of the uh, rangeland um, uh, areas to, to re-implement prescribed fire back out on the landscape. It is a process that our rangelands evolved with fire and grazing. And so that's one way uh, to deal with invasive, invasive red cedar. Uh, as far as the salt cedars, um, I have less experience with those. I do know that they um, establish from just clippings, you know, so mowing them actually spreads them even more. Um, and uh, it, is, it is a very serious issue. There are, there, there's been work done, I'm not sure who's done the work, but uh, to identify biological solutions, uh, a pest that, that does um, hinder its growth. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Ortega. Any experience with either of those? Uh, not specifically, but um, we, we do deal with invasive species of plant uh, very regularly, um, and, and I agree with, uh, with the gentleman. Um, you, you've got to hit it hard with uh, mechanically, chemically, and fire is, is probably the most cost-effective uh, strategy. Okay. Any other in the, in the panel with experience with the plants? Okay. 
All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. All right. I think uh, everyone who's wanted to participate this morning has had that opportunity to do so. Um, and I'll allow the ranking member to make any closing remarks before I uh, close the hearing. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here today. Very helpful and instructive for me. And um, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, share your uh, expertise. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. All right. I thank the ranking member, Rouser, for your cooperation and your staff always, along with our staff, who I think did a very good job this morning. The witnesses, I think, came well prepared and focused on areas that uh, normally the subcommittee doesn't always get uh, uh, an opportunity to really weigh in on, and that is the impacts that uh, invasive species, both native and non-native uh, species, have on agricultural uh, uh, economy throughout the country. And as it relates to the foreign uh, markets that we uh, obviously are actively engaged in and have to deal with as it relates to vital sanitary standards uh, and uh, with our efforts to export. Of course, we also import, um, and it is a two-way street. So uh, I think the takeaways, besides the specific comments that members, uh, that uh, those of you who testify this morning, are uh, I would urge uh, this committee um, and the full committee, uh, if they are not co-sponsors of Mr. Vela's legislation, that uh, focuses on improving staffing uh, within the uh, uh, inspection services and also within the USDA to look at that legislation carefully. I think it's worth uh, supporting and I think it has a, a lot of merit. And in addition, uh, while uh, Mr. Harder's legislation uh, deals with the invasive species of nutria and uh, specifically uh, right now in California, we know what the invest uh, 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 invasions in Maryland and Louisiana that uh, this uh, uh, very uh, aggressive uh, swamp rat, as Mr. Harder likes to refer to it, uh, can in fact uh, be a, a, a real problem in other areas of the country. And I think it deserves support as well. And we'll be working with both authors on those pieces of legislation. Having said that, uh, I want to thank again uh, the uh, um, uh, those who testified this morning uh, and your cooperation with the committee. And we'll look forward to continuing to work with you. And if there are any follow-up questions by members of the subcommittee, obviously we will forward them to you for your response. Under the rules of the committee, the record of today's hearing will remain open for 10 calendar days to receive additional material and supplemental written responses from witnesses to any question posed by a member. Uh, and uh, so at this point in time, hearing no objection, uh, the hearing of the Subcommittee on Livestock and Foreign Agriculture is adjourned. <laughs>